we're recording. Larissa, would you like to say something or? Yeah, I'd like to say, I'd, I'd, I'd like to say welcome. And uh, here we are at Lit Bomb. We try to be a little bit of a relief in these horrible times um, for you by bringing you a fantastic shows. And we have brought you a brilliant show tonight. We have superstar power here. We have Bob Holman. We have Maureen Owen. We have Janet Hamill. We have Mark Stackman. So it's going to be a great reading. Um, but I also want to tell you about next week. The bad boys from Epic Rights and Six Foot Swells are going to be here. We're going to rock your world and and épater your bourgeois. If you need your bourgeois épater, come next week. We have William Taylor Jr., Wolfgang Karsten, Julie Valen, and Todd Cirillo. And the Zoomathon is coming. The Zoomathon is coming. The Lit Bomb Zoomathon Democratic Fundraiser for the, the win in November 3rd. We are raising money for the Democrats with a superstar gala of poets. And on October 10th, we have our special guest host, Tara Campbell. We have Andre Kondrescu, Erica Jong, Joanna Furman, who's in the house today. Hello, Joanna. Allison Hedgecoke, Wednesday, Wendy Carlisle, a vid from Charles Bernstein, Christopher Gonzalez. Oh, there's so many people. And it's a three-week event, so we're doing it October 17th. We're doing it October 23rd. We have Carolyn Forshay coming. We have Martin Espada coming. We have um, Nick Hakim. We have Hugo Burnham from the Gang of Four. We, we have so many people, I can't even tell you. But I just, I, I just wanted to tell you, October 10, October 17, October 24th, be here. It's going to be fantastic. We have a cavalcade of poetic genius coming to see you. So let me kick it over to Mark and you'll say my propaganda, Mark? Always, always. So let me tell you, Larissa Schmilo is a poet, novelist, translator, editor, and critic. Her new novel is Sly Bang from Spite and Dival. Her first novel was Pancient Women from Blaze Vox. Her poetry collections are Medusa's Country, Hashtag Special Characters, In Paran, the chapbook A Cure for Suicide, and the e-book Fib Sequence. A new poetry collection, Dora Laura, is forthcoming from Salmon Poetry. Um, Larissa's poetry albums are The No-Net World and Exorcism, for which she won the New Century Best Spoken Word Album Award and all the tracks are available on iTunes, Spotify, etc. Her work has appeared in many anthologies, including uh, an anthology of poetic meters from Penguin, words for the wedding from Penguin, contemporary Russian poetry from Dolky Archives, Resist, Much Obey Little, Poems for the Inaugural from Spite and Dival, and over 30 others. Uh, Larissa is also the English language translator of the first futurist opera, Victory of the Sun, um, performed at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and many theaters and universities worldwide. Uh, Larissa also edited the anthology 21st Century Russian Poetry, which came out with Michael Rothenberg's Big British Press. And she's been a translator on the Russian Bible for the Eugene A. Nida Institute for the Biblical Scholarship of the American Bible Society. Um, Larissa's mission in life is to help mentally ill people through writing. Um, please contact her. Please see more about her at www.larissa, two S's, Schmilo, S H M A I L O dot com. Welcome, Larissa. All right. Thank you, my friend Mark. I appreciate it. My internet connection is unstable, but I try to be stable myself. So. I, I will read you a translation of Joseph Brodsky. It's a poem I tried to translate and couldn't. So it wound up in eight versions of mistranslation. This is New Life 2. Imagine that the war is over, that peace has reigned, that you can look at your face in the mirror again, that magpies, not bombs, whistle down upon your head, that Outside the city, homes are not destroyed. Instead, a Baroque burst of laurels, palms, magnolia, pine. Instead of red gunfire, 
a white hot Venus shines, that war's cast iron swamp is gone, and then the boredom is over, life has to start again. Imagine that all of this is true. Imagine that you speak of yourself, speaking of others, now that you can seek the irrelevant, the unneeded, the luxuries, the toys. Life begins anew exactly thus with noise, with erupting volcanoes and such catastrophes, a sloop lost below, friends lost beneath the seas. Look straight at the tragedies with the feelings these engender that you alone can see them with the tender feeling that any minute now you'll stern, you will turn away to home, to the safe moment, to ask it to stay. Imagine that the epoch ends in an idyll. The words that came in monologues are rain dialogues now and the flame that consumed others better than you greedily like logs that in you, it saw little use or warmth, and like the dogs, that's why you were spared, why shrapnel cut only your fear. Imagine the more honest the voice, the less it has tears. And when any polyphemus asks you who it is that speaks, say, who me? No one, like Odysseus, the Greek. Thank you. Okay. I, it's now my pleasure to introduce. It's now my pleasure to introduce my brilliant co-host and the technical wizard behind keeping us all safe here tonight, Jonathan, my my brilliant friend, Jonathan Penton. In 1998, Jonathan Penton founded, founded Unlikely Stories Org, which has been running as a continuously updated web magazine since. Unlikely Stories spawned a daughter company. Unlikely Books, which publishes three to five poetry management assistance to a number of literary and artistic ventures, such as the New Orleans Poetry Festival, Mad Hat, and Big Bridge. He has organized literary performances in Alabama, Arkansas, California, Chihuahua, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Louisiana, Massachusetts, New Mexico, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, Texas, and Washington state and DC, mind you. Um, his poetry books are Last Chap from Virgin Press, Blood and Salsa and Painting Rust from Unlikely Books, Prosthetic Gods from New Sins Press, Wing City Chapbooks, Standards of Sadity, which I loved, Lit Fest Press, and the Free to Eat Chapbook, which you can download from Argotus eBooks. You can download backstories free from Argotus eBooks. Take it away, dear Jonathan. Thank you, Larissa. All right, so I'm not very prolific. So most weeks I read something that we published recently in unlikelystories.org. Um, this week I'll be, I'll be reading a poem by Kevin Gallagher. Uh, it's, the, it's a poem for Philonis Floyd by Kevin Gallagher. They murdered your brother in broad daylight. He begged for help and cried out, I can't breathe. We're tired of seeing black people dying and the murder is not doing any time for a crime that everyone can see. They murdered your brother in broad daylight. They took a life and now they deserve life. They can't be able to walk away free. We're tired of seeing black people dying and then listen to murderers trying to claim it was your fault, not the police. They murdered your brother in broad daylight. They ground his neck on camera until he died as bystanders filmed, watched, begged, and pleaded. We're tired of seeing black people dying. You don't have any rights unless you're white. It's time for all of us to take a knee. They murdered your brother in broad daylight. I'm sick and tired of seeing black people die. I would be very pleased to introduce our co-host Mark Vincennes. Mark Vincennes is an Anglo-Swiss poet, a fiction writer, translator, editor, publisher, designer, multi-genre artist, and musician. He has published 14 books of poetry, including more recently, Becoming the Sound of Bees, Leaning into the Infinite, The Syndicate of Water and Light, and Here Comes the Night Dust. His newest collection, The Little Book of Earthly Desires, and a novella set in ancient China, Three Dows of Dows, or How to Catch a Fortuitous Elephant, 
are both coming, forthcoming in 2021 from Spoit and Dival. An album of music, Left Hand Clapping, is also forthcoming from Tritorn Records. Mark is a prolific translator and has translated from German, Romanian, and French. He has published 10 books of translation, most recently Unexpected Development by award-winning Swiss poet and novelist Klaus Mers. His poems have been published in many journals, including The Nation, Plowshares, The Los Angeles Review, World Literature Today, Raritan, and Plume. His work has received fellowships and grants from the Swiss Arts Council, the National Endowments for the Arts, and the Witcher Benner Foundation for Poetry. He's the editor and publisher of Medhead Press and publisher of New American Writing. He's lived all over the world, from Brazil to China to Iceland to India. He was born in the peak on Hong Kong, but uh, now lives in a farm in rural Western Massachusetts, where there are more coyotes and bears than people. Mark, will you be reading a poem for us today? Of course. This poem, after Jean-Paul Sartre, is called No Exit. We dropped into the seedless pod. We wanted to stay alive like Franz Kafka. We walked the hallways of banks and offices. We spent time at the municipal court. We courted, doted, and kowtowed. We ran a dog food factory. We collected stamps. We labored over love. We struck out. We laid it on thick. We turned in our early graves. We seeded. We followed the sweet, watery noise. We agreed without consequence. We flowed and we flushed. <clears throat> we turned up. We snuffed them out. We moved into questionable districts. We were fed up. We won in court. We lost everything and anything at all. We founded dynasties. We compartmentalized. We survived again and again. We rationalized. We found our frown, collected mushrooms, woodworms, ran out of juice. We found a home we had once known. We fished. We angled. We made a truce. We embraced our ghosts. We embattled and embittered ourselves. We ran still. We, and I know I've mentioned this before, but we soya beans. We uh, bound into servitude. We born and bred. We in our own company. We who are running from. We when the light wind rises. We shifting streams. We fish or pheasant. We from the first dawn. We on a little planet on the rim of a tiny galaxy. We bigger than ourselves. We immortals. We taken at our voice, our behest, or our Stockholm syndrome. We who cannot reach from the darkening shore. We who need a paddle or a puddle, who smell of rain, who are leaves suddenly upward moving, who are dry, furry, or blind, who are chasing a cat, who have a fear of strong winds, who are at ends with heaven's light, who grow and stretch in all directions, deep into the woods, who laugh and don't say, you too? The fire in the eye, the sad tale constructed from the firmament and the fragments, the he cried like a sneeze wolf, the letters we've written, the word, always the word, something that took the whole afternoon, and mind you, mind your place, mind whose noses twitch, who open forever, who are the sound of trees, who are the salt flood, or just a steady wind. Stand by. Well, thank you everyone so much for coming here and uh, joining us on this amazing event. Um, and we're going to start um, the build tonight with Mark Statman, who is uh, chiming in from Oaxaca, uh, Mexico. Mark has written 10 books. Among them are poetry, the poetry collections Exile Home, uh, That Train Again, A Map of the Winds, and Tourist and a Miracle. His translations include Never Made in America, selected poetry of Martin Barea Matos, uh, which came out with Lavender Inc., and Black Tulips, selected poems of Jose Maria Jonayosa, uh, from the University of New Orleans Press, and with Pablo Medina, a translation of Federico Garcia Loca's Poet in New York from Grove. Um, Mark's poetry and essays and translations have appeared in many anthologies 
um, as well as publications such as New American Writing, Tin House, uh, Tupelo Quarterly, Hanging Loose, Ping Pong, uh, and many others. Uh, he's a recipient of awards from the NEA and the National Writers Project. He is an emeritus professor of literary studies at Eugene Lang College of Liberal Arts, the New School. And as said, he now lives in San Pedro Islaqua. Islawaka. Islawaka and yeah. Oaxaca de Juarez. Welcome, Mark. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you to, um, to John and to Larissa and Mark. Um, I'm really excited about reading with Janet and Maureen and, and Bob. Um, I'm going to read um, a bunch of poems from my most recent book of poems, Exile Home, from Lavender Inc. It came out last year. And I'll close with a slightly long poem from my next book of poems, which is coming out next year, um, called Echiso, I think, yes. Um, and, um, and Exile Home is a, um, a collection that uh, kind of charts the time from when Catherine Koch and, and Jesse, our son, um, who goes by the stage, his stage name is Cannonball um, Statman, um, we moved to Oaxaca in 2016 from, from our beloved Brooklyn. And, um, and so Exile Home traces that, that journey, and, um, which is a very happy journey. And then the, the final poem I'll read at Chiso from the next book sort of is the other side of that journey. So it's, you know, there's the happy side and then there's the other side. So um, Exile Home is divided into five parts and I'm just gonna read a couple of poems from each of the sections of Exile Home. And um, so Exile Home, part one is called El Adios de Siempre, Brooklyn. Breaking in, last night it's dreaming, Brooklyn, our old house of things left behind, we needed to throw away, needed to destroy of ourselves. Of Fifth Street, of home, no longer home, what there is, who there is, no. What comes is crossing out, we cross out the old home to make new the new, cross the old to see still what was there. We cross the old, go forward for this celebration. We've fallen down the mountains of grace, become divers of fame underwater. We can't seek in twilight, destiny, or stars. We gave away at the end of holy days what we left on the tables of our homes. The ride back, the radio played, news, music. At a break, the announcer said, turn off at the sound, at the sound, at the fork in the road, where it's sky, where it's sky, where. Suave Patria for Efrain Velasco Sosa, who's a marvelous Oaxacan poet. Suave Patria. No man is an island, no woman, no child, is river, is cloud, is mountain, is ocean, uncontained, unwept, untouched, all are, by sound and cruelty, by love and poetry, the kind of love held in one's arms, the kind of cruelty that comes with the territory of hope, with threat, desire. The poem makes proposals for the world, take, hold, watch. When ice breaks in spring, what if there is no spring, no renewal, no rain, what, where, there is no ice. A blessing was the morning, moon, the midday sun, the march of over and blood far away. We don't have to hear and smell it. What we know, we know by word of mouth, from ear to ear. We learn the cold has come and the snows have come. The trees have broken from their weight from ice. We have longed to be far away. And now like that, the days. Part two of Exile Home is called The Middle of a Different Story, Oaxaca. Fair to say, living in two languages creates a third, like living in two houses, or like the way I'm in love with the presence of love. So here, so many years, is a singular love, though like the sky, like the earth, unchanging and unchanging with all the lived in rooms and all the words. The twist of fate. The air is full with ribbons, the colors of Mexico, and not the USA, and I don't mind. I'm in the middle of a different story, one where the ribbons come down, the star stars come down, the story full of blessings. We are the blessed, this air full of songs of red, white, green, in ribbons. Part three of, of Exile Home is called um, Casi to Cannonball, when we moved to um, Oaxaca, we brought our two Labrador retrievers with us. One was the older Cannonball, the Black Lab, and um, 
he died about six months after we moved down. And it was kind of wonderful that he got to spend his last days and not far away from the from New York win City winters. They weren't bleeding him. <laughs> and, um, and so we, we have a little country place in San Pedro y Slovaca, as Mark mentioned, and, um, and we named it Casita Cannonball after him. Vivo bien. These dry season cicada, their song of desire, whistling, piercing. It's a month of long lovemaking and urgency in trees, waving grasses. And those black and yellow birds fly with cicadas in their beaks, sus picos. Cicada season, scorpion season, cactus flower to cactus fruit, and the sun, setting sun, the ghostly clouds above the mountains. Ages of innocence. Around our heads and bodies, like the bees in that neighbor's house who have turned her hot water heater into a hive. When you open the house front door, there are black widow spider webs, black widow spiders. That's what we're used to now, the bees, their honey, and the spiders. Part four of Exile Home is known as Mi Mexico. To understand the welcome, become the stranger in the room, the room that lights the house, that lights the street with white and yellow, with something like talk, something like music, a wind, a voice, a heart, a sound, a welcome, welcome morning, welcome night, we say to each other, in, come, over, will, hear, say, enter. In love again. Your hair falls over your eyes, your face. We say, I was just thinking that, and I was going to say, we admit the borders we've been crossing, we still cross, we welcome. Living in, moving, having moved here, permanently, Catherine and I are permanent residents. It's been very strange. We've come back to the US a couple of different times um, to give readings and to see friends. And so it's, and it's very odd um, in this poem, a return. Which was it, being in Brooklyn or in Oaxaca? Which was homecoming? Which was home? Lingo. Someone asked, now that you live in Mexico, do you ever write in Spanish? A veces, supongo si. Sometimes I suppose, yes. La gente. Se muere que muere, pero tú sigas siendo lo mismo, said an older man to a friend even older. They were on line at a food stand at Llano Park. The people die, they die, but you keep on the same. He might have said, the sky today, or those trees. All the unseen, changing, written glass in water, clouds. You should have seen. How all the young girls were dancing in a circle together. They were holding hands. They were flowers or, or autumn. They were dancing in, they, with each other. There was no music. We could see only how their skirts moved, their arms moved, their bodies moved. They were in their own circle, their own world, their own lives. They trapped us. They enchanted us, we who disappeared in the end. The last section of, of Exile Home is called Once Upon a Time, and I'm going to read all the it's just, there are five poems in the section, and I'm going to read all five of them. They're fairly short. Once Upon a Time, A History of Poison. The house torn down by so many enemies, so much staying power, so much surrender. All night we hear the coming voices, incandescent, evanescent, imminent, whispers as if boats, the birds cried for hours in the trees, except the caracata that soars defiantly, elegantly, comes on this way, comes on the wind, above and below, another early promise. A history of rain. Once upon a time, all the baby owls were asleep. No one worked in the fields. It was quieter. A rooster, some goats. Javier pounding a fence post into the ground. Once upon a time, the llamas were asleep. Llamas in pajamas. The books were closed. No more stories throughout the skies. No one waited. Everyone waited. Buckets, water, water for the gardens. A history of rivers is carried along far, farther beyond the horizons, from source to destination, is love, then they break and they bend along. A history of wind. We rode the roads, the cars top down with funny rock and roll for a dancing car. Come on and play, you old so-and-so, you old happiness. Come on and play. We're the never tired boys and girls. A history of snow. Once upon a time, a dream of barking dogs, Apollo barked, Cannonball barked, the living meet the dead, names silence. Once upon a time, the porch doors opened, 
filled the bedroom with light. Snow was a memory of cold far away, a name. And so now I'm gonna read this long, slightly longer poem called Echiso. Um, and I'm really grateful for this kind of Zoom reading to be reading to so many people. So I see Greg Masters is here. I, I just, I'm looking at all the names. Um, there are four of my cousins are here. Um, which makes me very happy. And, and in this poem, their dad appears. So Linda and Gary and Ricky and Cindy, pay attention. Um, Echiso, and it has a little um, uh, epigraph from a wonderful young Oaxacan poet, Mariana Stefania. And it, it goes, Lleva en el cuerpo la casa en ruinas, abre la tierra, siembre algo que nazca, no muerto. Um, carrying your body, the house in ruins, open the land, the earth, um, plant something that will bo be born, not dead. Echizo. One, the image in itself, the image longing, the I love you and the far, I see your photo, I cannot see you, you don't respond, you in your distance and your difference, you say I've never thought of you, you say this isn't how I think, you ask me what God I believe in, you tell me some kind of story, your own story, your own God, it isn't my God, your story, your words crush, it's my chest, I take these words, one word written over another, you would try to, you would say, I, what would that close, what will you open, will you turn to me, two, I have an idea to put magic in the fire, make something more than fire. This will take time for its cue from the gods. There are still gods, there were, are, there is something in me which shall tire, torture in time and breathe, magic, magic, curse, when I expire, Byron. Then the past haunts the future the way the past haunts me. Three, wind rose, Rosa de los Vientos, Rose of the winds, a map of the winds, the compass, where does magic do its magic? The winds have suddenly come up. Do you know how hard it is to conjure lightning? Have you ever been struck wizard? Who is the wizard? Who is the wizard? I, dumbstruck, if I look in your eyes, I go down, I go. Who knows, have you learned I am helpless? For my mother says she is a witch. My uncle Jackie was the wizard. I learned the hard way. Do not mess with my family magic. Magic older than Hecuba. Five, magic older than Hecuba. Older than that witch, that priest, that older tree. It's a pachote tree. It divides earth from sky, those older branches, that older river. We are at the river, we are at the river, older and older and older. The fire far gone, the world, the ancient. What is the word I want to use to say? Before there was language, before there was breath, before there was chaos, and before there was the day or the night, you would walk around words of careless inequality. Have you heard the story of the wise man? He was an old wise man. He was our wisest wise man. He sold himself out to some magic. It wasn't temptation. It wasn't greed. It wasn't desire. He thought it is an art form. It is an art form. I can become the fallen in love. I can rescue the fallen in love. He was fallen into the wisdom of no and six. Your word is an ancient word. Your youth is an ancient world. Your God is, my, is not mine, but mine is older. Mine will not refuse your God a thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, thank you, thank you, for, thank you for ringing in from Oaxaca. Um, everyone, everyone can hear me fine? Okay, good. There was a slight echo at one stage, but um, seems gone now. So next, next we have Maureen Owen. Uh, Maureen is former editor in chief uh, of Telephone Magazine and Telephone Books. She's the author of Arison's Pull from Coffee House Press, a finalist for the Colorado Book Award and the Balcones Poetry Prize. Her title, American Rush, Selected Poems, was a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize. And her work, A.E. Amelia Earhart, was a recipient of the prodigious Before Columbus American Book Award. She has taught at Europa University, both on campus and in the low residency, uh, in, and in the summer program, and edited Europa's online zine, uh, Not Enough Night, through 19 issues. Her newest title, Edges of Water, is available from Chax Press, uh, Charles Alexander's, um, and she's most recently had work in Posit, Positive Magnets, Hurricane Review and Blazing Stadium. 
and she can be found reading her work on the Penn Sound website. Thank you so much for joining us, Maureen. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's, uh, this is my first Zoom reading, so see how it goes. <laughs> uh, it's great to be reading with such an illustrious, wonderful group of poets. Uh, I'm going to read from um, a new manuscript that um, I'm working on now, actually. Um, and it's, a, it's based on um, being a caregiver to my mother, who passed away uh, a few months ago. And it's titled, uh, Let the Heart Hold Down the Breakage, or The Caregiver's Journal. And there's a little epigraph at the beginning. She moves as paper moves, her skin upon the air. And um, each piece has its own title in the, in the book. This is called Mom. She wears my flip-flops in mid-afternoon sun. I shade her ankles and feet with my shadow. The pines nap too, still and drowsy in their altitude, as a baby breathes, soft and scarcely. It hurts my neck, but I can't stop staring up at them. Their glassy needle tops bristle, rolling, heaving, sea above. And this piece is called Distortions. It's um, for Lady Gaga and Cindy Sherman. Vast white ruffles of cloud, bustling, dense, whipped, froth, rich fuzz of tawny and slipping green, banks as though herds of seals sprawled, soft and sloping hills dyeing her long black hair black. I dyed my mother's hair. I was nine or 10, and we were too poor for her to frequent a salon. My mother had beautiful long black Irish hair, but she had gone white suddenly in her late twenties. I would pin my own fuzzy reddish hair back from my face, don big Playtex yellow gloves, and put on an apron. My mother would mix the magical Lady Clairol formula that smelled of hydrogen peroxide, put the same black splattered blue towel over her shoulders, and hand me the bulbous, the bulbous squeeze bottle and her comb. We'd set up in the bathroom, fashioning a bright commercial aluminum capped hanging bulb. I had a special washcloth to wipe off quickly any black splotches I squirted on her forehead or ear tips or on my own arms. I would part a section of her hair, lay a careful line of the black dye to the roots of the part, then comb it in and up and down the long strands. After we'd let, we'd let it set in for an instructed length of time. Then with me still wearing the oversized gloves, and she still in her blue towel. We'd go to the larger kitchen sink and I would kneel on a chair and give her a sudsy shampoo and rinse out all the extra dye. Bending over her shoulders and neck, I could see the black strands flow apart and the white of her scalp emerge in tiny winding rivers. And um, this part is called, if you can paint sound, you can write paint. I cook us dinner, mom helps set the table. Her food has to be piping hot. I heat her plate in the microwave, spoon veggies steaming from a pan on the stove, chicken dish straight from the oven. We come to our meal, but after a few bites, is this supposed to be cold, she raises? No. I'll warm it in the microwave. Taking her plate into the kitchen, not able to see well on many a bite, her empty fork goes into her mouth. She chews it anyway, refusing help. Eating becomes a long, slow process. Again and again, food's too cold. 
I reheat and reheat her dinner. Fresh water with ice, served dessert, dinner finished. Found San Francisco 49ers baseball game on TV for her. I'm back in kitchen cleaning up, doing dishes. She's hollering now. It's too loud. I'm too close to the TV. Too loud. Are you listening to it in the kitchen? No, I can't hear it in the kitchen. I adjust the TV sound. I think it was just the commercial, so much louder than the game, I say, resuming dishes. But pitch now into the sudsy flow, swirling out of control down the dark cavern of the drain's wash, its rushing fall hurling through forests of pipes in the black earth below us. Um, some of my titles are um, a bit long, so this is the title. She could put on her left ear hearing aid, but not her right, and sometimes she could not put on her left either. This is the poem. Back then, she would swing me up behind the saddle of the smoky Mustang, go full gallop up the cow pasture till the very end fencing. My skinny arms wound around her waist for dear life, bounced and flown, my sides pitching and aching. Then turn and gallop back through the cows, leap up the ditch, trotting the gravel driveway back into the yard. And this is another kind of long title. I would become the black sheep of the family obliquely included. When I sneeze, she jolts and flutters. Why are you sneezing? What makes you sneeze? Everyone sneezes once in a while, I say. You sneeze all day, my mother charges. No, I don't, I rarely sneeze. Oh, she snaps, you sneeze all the time. A reoccurrence whenever I do sneeze or cough, so that I've become self-conscious about sneezing or clearing my throat. I contort to prevent my sneezes. I begin to count them. Am I sneezing too often? This has never occurred to me before. And um, This piece was done for, um, for an art exhibition that got canceled because of the virus, but hopefully it will appear in New York at some point. Perfection isn't stable. As though ascending in an elevator, enormous white of Kleenex floating cubes, rectangles of it, kitchen counters, bedside table trays, bureaus, dresser tops, her pockets airily stuffed of blouse and pants, Jackets, PJs, coats, and vests. Piled four pillows high, steep hill of feathers, mauve size between, a thin red satin ribbon sewn, nightly toppling. Folding her boxy blue and white striped embroidered with tiny cobalt palm trees swaying, long after she wore his black t-shirts to bed, her seersucker pants, Faded cowboy shirt, snap buttons, ribbing on the cuffs. Yellow doorway trapezoid. Who is that boy? She queried. Puffs of smoking pigment rising spread. A geography of colored liquid through his burning clothes. This is quite a long title. <clears throat> I imagine she was not my grandmother's daughter, but conceived bone immaculate out of the Minnesota prairie, born on horseback. 3.50 a.m., Bergman's Hour of the Wolf, hall light in my eyes, a squeaky rasp. My back is killing me, it's so itchy. Can you rub my back, put some cream on, rub my shoulders, the bottoms of my feet, my arms, rub my thumb. My thumb is so itchy. Do I have a pulse? Her small, frail skeleton wisps, syllables and bits, crystallized cold dawn. I'm sorry I had to wake you. It's all right.
and uh, this title is um, from uh, Achebe's Things Fall Apart. There is no story that is not true, said Uchindu. Who are these people, she asks. What people? The ones that come in here at night, they stand in the doorway talking. Mm, you must be dreaming them. No, no, they are real people. They sleep in here. Some of them sleep on the floor. Do you recognize any of them? No, I don't know them. One is a tall man. He stays in the doorway talking. The women are older with gray hair. I thought I heard you talking to them. No, I haven't seen them. One came in with you last night. With me? Yes, he was behind you. All duets fracturing. I tuck her oxygen cord over the coat rack, above the doorway, through the title page of the kitchen god's wife on top of the bookshelf so she won't trip on it, getting out of bed during the night. Airplane crash near the doll's head. To feel the length of her body again, as I lifting when she bent her bending. No compass needing on sidewalks. We don't have nowhere to go. Scarlet witches. Did I have a father? No, nobody there. We just walk, handfuls of ditch lilies, clouds thin as stitches. Who's Mariposa tulip, neon hedgehog cactus? Chiaroscuro cold case spits warm water, hair barbered in a boy's cut. She wore her brother's hand-me-downs, a flesh where once these toothpick arms buried a face in a horse's mane. I am her secrets now. Fling two windows wide to a vast crystal dark, to the butterfly nebula, 3,800 light years away. Jets and gas bubbles peel off its stars. Stellar winds slam its nebula. Her chaos. I'm a mess. Why can't I get better? Chapstick, rose, rosary, face cream, pillow pile, ice water, toothpick, tums, bedside science stories. Once upon a time, there was a rainforest near the bottom of the world. And the last one. <clears throat> Are we going home now? I need to get out of here. Let's go. She fired me the first night I insisted she wear the adult diaper to bed. No, she finaled. I insisted. I want someone else who works here, she said. That's it. Thank you. Don't we always want someone else? <laughs> thank, thank you, Maureen. Thank you. And next up we have uh, Janet Hamill, who's the author of eight collections of poetry and short fiction. Her work has been nominated for Pushcart Prizes and the Poetry Society of America's William Carlos Williams Prize. Her uh, Tales from the Eternal Cafe was named one of the best books of 2014 by Publishers Weekly. Um, Janet is a strong proponent of the spoken word. She has performed at the Poetry Project at St. Mark's Church, the Walt Whitman Cultural Center, the Bowery Poetry Club, the Knitting Factory, CBGB's Gallery, where I perform as a, as a musician myself, uh, the New York and Cafe, Central Park, Summer Stage, and many more. Uh, also including, you know, in Ireland, in London, at the um, Smith's, Patti Smith's Meltdown Festival, and Liverpool's Heartbeat series. She was one of the first poets contracted to Mouth Almighty Records, and she released two CDs of spoken word and music in collaboration with the uh, bands Movie Star and Lost Ceilings, Flying Nowhere, and Genie of the Alphabet, two albums. A documentary about the, about, uh, the creative process of Janet Hamill and Lost Ceilings, directed by Brian Hamill, a bearing witness, is viewable on YouTube. Uh, Janet has been a writer in residence at Europa University, a teaching assistant at New College and an instructor at Cabrillo College. Uh, she has lectured and taught workshops 
at the Poetry Project, the College of Poetry, the Seligman Centre, the Goshen Library, as well as many clubs and galleries in London and Liverpool. After residing in New York City for three decades, Janet recently moved to New York's Hudson Valley, where she founded and directs the teaching and reading series Megaphone. Thank you for joining us, Janet. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Oh, excellent. Okay. Hi, thank you for having me and having me in such wonderful company and being joined by such wonderful people. It's really an honor. I'm reading really in support of my selected poems, which have just come out from Spite and Dival. And I think, I think with that book, um, I'm going to move on to prose. Uh, I'll try to read uh, something from each of the books. Uh, there are, it's a collection of seven different books of poetry, but uh, I don't want to uh, go over my time. So I'll try to read as much of it as I can. I don't know if I can do something from all seven books. This is from uh, the first book, Treblante, and it's The Lonesome Death of H. Crane. The dawn was revealing himself like a long lost sailor over the ruins of the pyramid of the sun. I wished he'd rain like a heaven of alcohol into my face, tightening like the skin on a drum in a mirror over the bar, dissolving into a round of lacerating light, cut like a splinter of shot glass into my heart's muscle of thirst, spleen for a flask of tequila, eagle of mescal. Your nights were a hell of cantinas, searching the soul of a serpent, coiling the ground of the dawn like a prostitute, spilling the earth with a urine of cigarette butts and beer under a table, baptizing my face with a shower of crystalline star shattered nerves. Oh, Mexico, how you betrayed me. I hurl a glass into the side of your sun-splashed murals of democracy, decaying visions of inebriated seers, serapi of Quetzalcoatl. You wrapped around me with the warmth of a cobalt dragon on days rising like mandatory mist over jungles full of inebriated seers, over jungles full of, excuse me, uh, over jungles through, like predatory mist over jungles through copulating birds, my mind racing like a thoroughbred horse's head in flames through a field of discarded bottles, the apocalyptic jockey winking an eye at the sun. And now, let the ship swing further into the Gulf Stream's warm waters of Caribbean lush. The days of the roaring boy are done. I'm ready for death like a patient in my pajamas to dive like a dolphin into the sea, breaking light like a splinter of shot glass into the mouth of a hungry, white shark and let them comb the sea like scavengers for the bones of my landlocked wings. In case it wasn't obvious, that's about Hart Crane, one of my all-time favorite uh, American poets. Uh, this next poem is Sacrifice from Temple. The Temple, which was uh, very graciously published by Maureen's Telephone Books. Sacrifice. There's a fire inside the mountain where a puma rests on the continents of silence, the unfurnished living rooms in space where now a sacrifice takes place. Behind a land mass of skeletons, the ice flows creep, long lines of leopards in the snow. You have to go to keep the logs, keep burning in a hailstorm, the corpse of a bat in the night stills 
the window sills are dirty, and hope trembles on the legs of a dying, praying mantis. Solstice, leave me now like this forever. The eyes pleading, leave me now like this forever. The soft white flesh of a Spanish heart in my hands, a neck, a tender neck thrown back into submission, a face full of resignation, the eyes pleading, close me now like this forever. Shut the light, release the seas, the endless ocean voyages of melancholy. Ions flare in the fire, the bookshelves rise like a tower of the arcane world. You cling in a silk cocoon of a yellow sheet like a wing of Baal's angels, the ancients. Press on your skull like a tumor, the manuscripts curl in a flame. And I light a light in the darkness, the cigarettes drop to the floor and they reappear, the long lines of leopards in the snow. It's time to go into a courtyard, into an unfurnished living room and space to make your grace beneath the jaws of a generous lion, teeth capped down to the bone, a layer of platinum, morphine, erotic waves of criminal water. With a bite to the juggler, you'll break on through, releasing the final vials of congenital poison and millenniums of endless ocean voyages. Okay, this next one is from Nostalgia of the Infinite. Uh, this, I guess, I guess you would call this a, a, a Fraxis poem. Uh, there was an exhibit in, uh, at the Museum of Modern Art in the 80s, the early 80s of de Chirico. And I had never seen that much of his work at one time. And I, I just flipped out. I just went crazy. I couldn't believe how great he was. And uh, I was already very much into surrealism at that time. And found out that he had been a great influence on surrealism. In fact, the titles of all of his paintings were named by Breton. So this is a poem from that series from Nostalgia of the Infinite called The Sphinx at Sea, the real title of which is The Seer. That's Breton's title. Seen from a distance, your bare shoulders under the lamplight. Oops. Excuse me. Seen from a distance, your bare shoulders under the lamplight. Oh, I, I just missed it. Ah, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Seen from a distance, your bare shoulders under the lamplight, nocturnal, moon dusted mountains of snow, sequestered in eternity. Behind your eyes, the wind blows over the ocean stirring the surface of the water as you board your gold seraphic boat, the thoughts beginning and beginning again, recumbent, rock carved, reading pages of Greek philosophy, the small pine island of the gods appears, a raw and brilliant emerald in its matrix, so crowned, the sea takes you away in her long, gloved arms, in her blue gloved arms, she takes you far from the keening chorus on the beach, beating time on harps and drums while the rain drives in their faces. Uh, this next one is from Lost Ceilings. When we first moved up here in the 90s, uh, I miss New York so much. It was just an ache, like a physical ache. And fortunately, I'm not that far from the city, so I could still get down on the train pretty frequently. But uh, I just missed it so much, not the, even the people so much. And one of the reasons I, I moved, or we moved, was because so many friends had, had moved out of the city. 
So it was actually the buildings in some ways that I was aching for. And um, so this is a little, this book, Lost Ceilings, is from Lost Ceilings, which is a tribute to uh, New York City, my love, my love home to New York City. This is called White Evening. I, and snow in the city, just, I just always loved so much. This is about snow in the city. Now exquisite quiet lulls the buildings in the weight of snow falling in front of windows on the avenue. A frozen desolation kindles my eyes. The frozen course, tender correspondence of the stars. Above the snow and the snow below, bowing to kiss the city's hardened breast. Her lurid flesh is white as a supplicating Magdalene beneath the street lamp. Nothing. The season, the evening, and the drifts effacing time spent with my monotonous soliloquy. Going home to wines, Internal summer, eternal summer, burning in the absence of prayerful rites, like a candle in the cavity of an ice sculpture. Okay, this next one is A Thousand Years from Body of Water, which was published by Bowery Books. Thank you, Bob. It's called A Thousand Years. I wrote it uh, to mark the change of the millennium. But then when I was thinking abstractly, the, any day can be the beginning of a new millennium. So it seems to be, it seems to work for any time. How goes the night? How goes the watch? As midnight approaches in the storm waves of the sky, the moon beats an old fist on her old yellow drum. A thousand years have passed away. A thousand years are yet to come. How goes the night? How goes the watch? A lone sailboat makes its way through trolling towers sounded by the motion of the sea. A thousand years fill the hold with dust and desire. A thousand years of naked wings to set free. Fragile, the wilderness, the skeleton bells ring for eternally turn. Another March breeze blowing across the planet. Another life with new idols and the same concerns. How goes the night? How goes the watch? Floodwaters swallow enfeebled horses fallen from the cracks in the dome. A thousand years of races in the funeral beds. A thousand years of fits and starts before we're home. How goes the night? How goes the watch? In the end, there's a full single sail propelled by its own will. A thousand years bring a pale beacon with the coming dawn. A thousand years of moving forward and standing still. Fragile, the wilderness, the skeleton bells ring for eternal return. Another March breeze blowing across the planet. Another life with new idols and the same concern. And this final poem I'll read is from my book, Knock, which is published by Spite and Dival, which also published uh, The Selected. I uh, don't know how to describe this. Um, these, is a these are a series of pantoons, which is a, a form which originated in Malaysia and then was somehow brought to either France or England in the 19th, early 19th century. And it's repeated lines, or and or, with, within a certain pattern. Not every line is repeated. And to me, I think it's from Malaysia, and it, it, and it takes the form it does, because 
I have a vision of the waves repeating, moving out and then coming back and moving out and coming back. And not every wave looks the same, and yet some look identical. So this is from the section on New York. It doesn't have a title. It's just one of the poems from Knock of New York. Tell me something I can hold on to, something to fill empty space, a star name. Sold as white wine, it tasted like piss. Say something over this bad excuse. CBGVs spell cut glass in four letters. Transcendence is a 13 letter word. I used to go to see my friends break guitar strings in ripped jeans and t-shirts. Sold as white wine, tasted like piss. Say something over this poor excuse. Most bands were unaware of REM sleep. All they knew was needles and Heineken. I used to go to see my friends break guitar strings and ripped jeans and t-shirts. Patty's horses and television's marquee moon were in love with French symbolism. Most bands were unaware of REM sleep. All they knew were needles and Heineken. I stayed until they started lobbing bottles at the audience. What was the point? Patty's horses and television's marquee moon were in love with French symbolism. Someone put a tear in my eye and walked me home to Bleecker and Elizabeth. I stayed until I started lobbing bottles at the audience. What was the point? The music was grounded in three chords of bowery flooded gutters and graffiti. Someone caught a tear in my eye and walked me home to Bleecker and Elizabeth. Tell me something I can hold on to something to fill empty space, a star name. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Janet. Thank you. Do you have a star name for us? Excuse me? Do you have a star name for us? Ah, let me see. Corpius, or the dog star, or... Um... Cor Corpius sounds good. Yeah, you like that? Okay, okay. That fits, that fits Drake, me. Draco, there are so many. I used to end the poem sometimes with a long list of, of star names, but I didn't do that today for the, for the sake of time. Yeah. Thank you. But thank oh, you. Oh, the, the one for the crown. There's so many, there's so many. Anyway, Bob, yeah. Bob's coming up next. Excellent. Uh, Bob, Bob Holman is the founder of the Bowery Poetry Club and the author of 17 collections, uh, most recently The Unspoken, um, then The Life Poem, The Cutouts, Sing This One Back to Me from Coffee House. Bob <coughs> has taught at Princeton, Columbia, NYU, Bard, and a new school as the original slam master and director at the New York and Poets Cafe. Bob was also creator of the world's first spoken word poetry record label, My Mouth Almighty slash Mercury, and the altruistic director of the Bowery Poetry Club. Bob has played a central role in spoken word, slam, and digital poetry movements of the last several decades. All told, he's performed over 1,000 times around the globe, from Madison Square Garden, rock stadiums, to church basements, and Ethiopian Tejbet's honey wine bars. Uh, Bob is co-founder of the Endangered Language Alliance, his study of hip-hop and West African oral traditions, uh, which led to his current work with Endangered Languages. He's also the producer, director, and host of various films, including The United States of Poetry, On the Road with Bob, Hol Bob Holman, his film about language loss and re revitalization, Language Matters with Bob Holman, winner of the Berkeley Film Festival's Documentary of the Year Award, and was produced by David Grubin and aired nationally on PBS. Bob has traveled for the film and led workshops at language revitalization centers across 
Alaska and Hawaii, sponsored by the Ford Foundation. His short film, Konze, Poem of Many Tongues, has lines of poetry in 50 languages and premiered at the Margaret Mead Film Festival. In 2018, Bob was awarded the Chambra Doc Premio Ostana Award for his work in language revitalization. His roots are in Harlem, Kentucky, and he currently lives in the Bowery, or on the Bowery, in New York City. Thanks so much for joining us, Bob. My pleasure. Thank you all for being here, for sticking around. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Okay, beautiful. You know, just th these are four, I mean, to the other, they're friends. We're all friends, and it's so great to see, uh, to hear everybody here. Thank you uh, very much, Litbaum, for having us. Um, this morning, I was making my phone calls for, uh, for Joe Biden. I made 20 calls to Texas. Two were for Biden. Uh, two of the, the respondents were from, for Biden, two for Trump. And uh, one of them was a robo answering machine. Have you ever got one? I couldn't believe it. You know robo calls that you get, but there are actually answering machines that will keep you on the line. Oh, I've got another stack of papers to look at. But when finally she said, there's a pizza guy at the door, I realized I wasn't talking to anybody. Um, and the other phone calls were, of course, hangups, which is what we'd all do anyway. But just to say, let's activate and get something done here. Um, so great to have Marjorie Tesser in the audience, who is the founder of Bowery Books that uh, published uh, Janet's uh, wonderful Body of Water, and also the two books that I have just coming out and from which I am going to read. Here I go to read first from Life Poem, which was written um, 50 years ago. So if you can imagine me at 19, um, I'll just read the beginning and the end. Desperate now, I've started to write everything that comes into my head. I just lay it out right here, as if the lined paper had become some sort of giant garbage disposal, accepting and grinding everything I can throw out. If this were a giant baseball game, this paper would be Willie Say Hey May's great center fielder making deliciously slow basket catches of every ball hit by every batter in either league. Have you discovered yet that this is not a book? Stop, go back, reread. Here, you forgot these, the eyes. They plop down here. Put them in the right way or else watch the inside of your mind. Poems cough, metaphors hide, do parables, Describe or disguise. If I wrote in rhymes, would you read easier? If I didn't write at all, would you breathe easier? Do the words get in the way? Have you discovered yet that this is not a book? Poetry is a stance. Accept it and see. If you close your eyes, see the dancing spots, you're creating art. Open them to the world. You created life. This life poem jogs along on the tip of your eyelash, your witness. Okay, so that's what I sounded like at 19, and uh, see if there's any difference in the, uh, the unspoken, which as you can see was originally titled Bob Holman and the Spoken Word Movement, but we did some editing to get the title uh, condensed a bit there. It's got a poem on the cover, who knows? Who cares? Why bother? How come? What possible difference could it make? Well, as you see, this guy knows exactly what it is. Okay. Drawing by Paul Zinkovich. Let's see. Um, how about uh, starting off with uh, the spring cleaning list from March 20th, uh, 2010. Uh, 10 years later on that date, um, Ann Waldman's granddaughter was born and my granddaughter were born. So it's an auspicious date, just 10 years before the babies came in COVID time. List, I am working on Saturday. I am waiting for my daughter to call to tell me what I must be doing. 
I am feeling complaints about an organization that I founded, a service organization in a field, spoken word, where there are painfully few resources and from which I wish to just dive off the fucking stage and disappear without bitterness, neither. I'm dealing with the window through which some drunk tossed a rock last night, a thermal window on the girls club side of the Bowery Poetry Club. I'm prepping for two classes at Columbia this week because they messed up on the website. I'm way behind on the Welsh, but I'm mending all ear the didgeridoo. I've decided to postpone the ayahuasca because I can't stand to have my psychedelic experiences confined, confined to a timeline. I'm chairing a panel on Faye Chang at NYU on Wednesday. I'm finally reading at the 92nd Street Y next Saturday and Sunday. Typically, it's through the dance department, a duet with Melissa Finley, not the poetry department. I'm prepping to spend three weeks in Canada in April, reading and performing. I'm having fun with my daughter in town and wish my other daughter were here too. I'm thinking about the gas heart and think Dagny should set a date for it in LA and get some crazy cast together like James Gandolfini and Sapphire and Claire Danes who are all performing at the Bowery Arts and Science Hollywood Does Poetry Benefit on May 2nd. I'm thinking about your transcendent and down home earth brand of telepathy. How sweet it is in a blister. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. That was fantastic. Great. Oh, I'm getting feedback. That must mean my time is about over. Um, <laughs> this is a real shorty. It's called uh, Every Word. And I would urge you to memorize this. Every word in a poem is a poem. That's it. I'll do it again. No, I won't. You know it. Every word in a poem is a poem. Um, do I have time to read one more? Absolutely. Go. It's epic. <laughs> no, it is longer. <laughs> okay, but it's for Pablo Neruda. So, Poema de Alabanza para Pablo Neruda. And uh, going all the way out to Mexico. Uh, oy. Oh, sing, poet or not, your voice croaking with wonder. Where the magic at? You were not born. El Vate, the seer, your eyes distinguish the domain of poetry stretched like garters around the thickest thighs, pedaling away in the great make love on a bicycle race, all the way to the end of the poem, where revolution lifts and sings the pure blood of sunset, the tragic rush of night by night, the neon terror of moonlight, only you can see by it, O oh, Vate, O oh, Seer, O oh, Neruda, all oh, praise your pistol of words, La Pistola. Oh, Neruda, here we are where the body is spice, salt, and sweat. Why, one day, the road itself started walking, and luckily Pablo was there. Stop, road, he cried. How can I go about my business if you won't stay still? And the road answered, and Neruda got it all down. And that is his poem about artichokes. Five I love yous and socks, don't forget, because the way the sea wave broke over his eyebrow became his ode to Whitman and left the critics strangled. And if only Madonna and Julia Roberts would read my poems, the exhausted ghost of Neruda was heard muttering out there in a heap, inventing God. Whose hurricane? Yours, maestro. Whose abyss? Yours. Do you remember the time you said you were bored of it, bored of being a man? We were on our way over to the Bowery Poetry Club and we dropped by the tailors you like so much over on Essex Street. Your pants weren't ready. That was an explosion right there. And then we walked past the barber shop and you got a whiff and it was like all hell broke loose. Could we have a little vacation from things, please? You roared. 
no more boulders, no shirts or gardens, insane asylums, merch or contact lenses, elevators. I was writing all this down furiously. It was a poem, I said to the passerby, all of whom were either frightened or pretending that nothing was going on. This is New York after all, you bellowed an elephant calf on Broadway, transformed from human skin into the beast that uses its nose for a ladle. Oh, grab me, you informed my destiny, and swing aboard your damn praise poem isn't worth one lash of my eye, one corpuscle from my bleeding tongue. Give me a full woman, you continued. Now you're just trumpeting. And I know the mosquitoes that were buzzling around your ear were in love with your protein-saturated blood. What does it mean, a poem of praise for a poet whose universe is a poem of praise? Okay, this here is a vial of poison bin, crimson lime and foamy, a, a, a wind-whipped umbrella poking out cat's eyes, and God's toothpick, and of course, the old reliable belly button, el ombligo, not my own, un poco de problema. No hay problema. Problema? Aquí. Yo tengo uno. Más de uno de hecho, un puñado de ellos. Mi vida es un enorme problema hecho de uno mirando de pequeños problemas. Ayúdame, problema aquí, ahora mismo. No es problema encontrar problema. Ven aquí, lo sacamos del saco. Problemas, problemas, problemas. ¿Cómo te atreves a decirme que no hay problemas? Bromeas. Problemas, 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 no problem over here. Come on, I got them, I got them by a bag full. My life is actually one big problem made out of a gazillion tiny ones. Okay, come over, it's no problem to find the problem. Here you got them, problems. You, how dare you tell me? No problem. Are you kidding? Problem, problem, problem. But meanwhile, there's no meanwhile. The lush mannerisms of the palm world, the relentless wings of the sea call back the melting earth. As we take the poet's hand, as he grabs the pen, together we swing the curves to loops and dots to crossings as the poem emerges. Praise the poem dancing into being. Praise the words, translations of all things Praise all things, manifestations of words. Praise Pablo Neruda. Neruda, as the pen dives to translate the word Pablo Neruda. Thank you. Uh, let me get this one last poem, the last poem in the book. So right. like, this is it. The world is ending and the piano is playing. And the artwork is all of us on stage. Lift your voices and lift the roof and lift the sky and lift the heavens. And for Christ's sake, sing. This is it. It is. The end. It is. Gracias. Well, thank you all you future amazing people um, including Mark Statman from Oaxaca, Maureen Owen, Janet Hamill um, from Hudson River Valley, and Bob, I'm guessing, in Brooklyn. Is that right? Um, Actually, I'm in L.A. with my granddaughters. Oh, right, 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 right. You, you granddaughters, right? I have two granddaughters in the last nine months, and one who is four years old, three altogether. Wow. Yeah, that's what I say. Lots, lots, of, <laughs> lots of poetry on that, man. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, this has been an, an, an absolutely amazing show. Thank you, everyone, for showing up. Um, and we're going to move on to our open mic section of the evening, um, which um, Larissa is going to um, take the reins on. And uh, yeah, um, it's been an amazing, an amazing event.
and um, let us all hang in there. All Thank right. You. All right, ladies and germs, let's hear it one more time for Mark Statman, Janet Hamill, Maureen Owen, and Bob Holman for rocking the lip bomb today. Absolutely. No problemas, no problemas here whatsoever. Brilliant, guys. That was fantastic. Once again, I adjure you to come next week when we have the bad boys and girls from Epic Rights. We have William Taylor Jr., Wolfgang Carstens, Julie Bell, and Todd Surreal are going to rock your world. Don't miss it. October 3rd and the Zoo October 24th. Our fun. Oh, they need help. You know you want to do it. So please join us. And we will be having special guest hosts, Tara Campbell and Indran, who is in the house today, and Patricia Spears Jones are all going to help us out with this. And we're going to have Andre Kondrescu, Erica Jung, Martin Esperla, Karen Fosche, a cast of thousands. October 10th, October 17th, October 24th. If you're going to donate, donate here. We'll be going every all proceeds open mic and in the house. Do we have Ralph Culver? Ralph, could we unmute Ralph? How are you doing, Ralph? I'm doing well, thanks. Can you guys hear me? Good. Yes, we can. Um, all right. Um, wonderful reading. Thank you to everyone who read tonight. It was great to hear you. I'm going to read a, a short-ish poem called Threnody by the President for the Victims of COVID-19, beginning with a line by Shishlov Milos. One, you whom I could not save, can we make our peace? There were so many of you, and one body, after all, is very like another. One life is like another, in spite of what you want to believe. The dead in any language are still the dead. It's clear that I was confused, lost in the cool, deep grave of my skull, as the heat of the day made corpses in the street sit up and roll away from the sun. Addled and jaded, peremptory, determined to dissociate your fate from my own. That was my first test and my first failing. Two, you whom I did not save, can you forgive me? Of course, if it were up to you, I've convinced myself you would have made the same choice. It occurs to me not for the first time that our days here are spent entangled in fables, making our excuses one after another, that I have become so proficient, so adept at evading the truth that I would pronounce myself blameless for every death, including my own. Three. You who would not be saved, that army of one who bears my name, I give you thanks for ignoring the pleas of the others and accepting your own damnation in exchange for what now passes for my life. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ra. Thanks for thanks for sharing with us. We appreciate it. All right, um, I'm pleased to present Jose Enrique Del Monte. Jose, can we un unmute you, please? Jose Enrique Del Monte. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Bienvenido, Hello. Jose. Hello, Larissa. Thank you. Thank you a lot. I will read the poem in Spanish. Um, and it will translate by, by, by a translator in the group. My poem is Páginas Dobladas. Si lo hubiéramos sabido, habríamos derruido el tiempo con las manos, sin remordimientos, apretujados los segundos, que deciden la validez de las cosas. Las escarchas habrían quedado 
dormidas en las páginas dobladas, como cicatriz de suspicacias, como fisura de longitudes poderosas. Es tan tenue la distancia ancha de la boca que separa la gigantez de la esencia, que allí sobresale el miedo o se percibe la mirada de los errantes conocidos. Es tan roja la esfera del pecado que nos asumimos ruido, nos convertimos en simiente, nos trasnochamos en la nada. Y aún en la duda, confundidos con la similitud de los días en que la bruma atraviesa la sombra o la sombra se asemeja al alba, debíamos destruir el tiempo si lo hubiéramos sabido, donde la nostalgia es un hilo suficiente para eternizar simplezas y guardar las páginas dobladas. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you, Jose. Uh, can we unmute Susan Dickey for the translation, please? Yes. Susan, can we unmute Susan for the translation, please? Susan Dickey. Susan. Yeah. I've folded pages by Jose Enrique de Monte. If we had known, we would have consumed time with our hands without remorse. Squeeze the seconds that decide the validity of things. The frost would have stayed asleep in the folded pages as a scar of suspicion, as a fissure of powerful longitudes. It is so tenuous, the wide distance from the voice that separates vastness from essence, that there stands out fear, or one perceives the gaze of the unknown wanderers. This fear of sin is so red that it turns into noise. We stay up late in the nothingness. And even in doubt, confounded by the similarity of days in which the mist crosses the shadow or the shadow resembles the dawn, we must have had, and we must have destroyed time if we had known. If we had known where nostalgia is a thread sufficient to eternalize simplicity and to keep the folded pages. Thank you so very much, you, Jose and Susan. Thank you so very much. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Susan. All right. Next up, we have Leslie Prosterman. Can we please unmic? Not unmic. Can we please mic? Uh, Leslie Prosterman, please. Leslie, you're up. Okay. Thank you very much, and it was great to hear everybody. Um, Last week was the first yard site, the end of the first year of mourning for Steve Dalashinsky. And a year ago at this time, I wrote this poem for him called Kaddish for Dalashinsky. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, I called your name out in the synagogue. I didn't want to. When they asked all those in mourning to please rise, I stood. I called your name out loud. I rang it through the hall into the heads of us, praying in the holidays, listing the dead for a blessing. I called out your name so that everyone could hear you, so that Steve Dalashinsky was everywhere in all the high corners, just the way you always liked it. Everyone heard you. I didn't want to but I did it for you this new year when you should have been in the clubs and not in shul. Called clear across and into the listening ears, catching your reverbs of Whitman and Alan, what's his name, that other Jewish fellow who wrote that poem, Kaddish. For you, Steve, Kaddish. I didn't want to, but I called out your name. Thank you so much, Leslie, and thank you for reminding us of the great Dalachinsky. 
gone but never forgotten. Thank you very much. A very beautiful poem for, for Steve Dalachinsky. And, and, and uh, all of us loved him very much. <laughs> Although he tried, tried hard not to make us sometimes. <laughs> all right. Anyway, moving right along. We have next, we have Karen Newberg. Can we unmute Karen? Karen Newberg. Okay, am I, you can hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful. This is an amazing, fantastic event. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm going to read the story of my story. Over time, some of the pages have gone missing. They fly in the wind and sometimes land at my feet. Too often, I inadvertently step on them and keep going or rain plasters them to my windows. The ink runs. Sometimes I see my story in my mirror, crooked teeth, gray brows. I run my story down a page. It weeps a new sorrow than it used to, picks the lint of loss, fluffs it into a pillow. I sleep on my story. I sleep in it. It sleeps in me. It buries itself in me. My story has become quiet has become mystery. I have to beg it to share itself, to share those exciting bits that had me hanging by my fingertips over ledges of want, over desire, over my adventures of accumulation and achievements and failures, of walks by frozen lakes and weaving through crowded city streets. There are a million viewed trees in my story and a million lights seen in houses and apartments. My story has become the impression of all that has happened more than what has actually happened. It doesn't seem to mind, so why should I? But somehow I do. Thank you. Did we lose Larissa? I think we might have lost Larissa. We may have lost Larissa. Um, is Smitha here tonight? Uh, I'm not seeing you, Smitha, under that name. Are you here? If you're here under a different name, please hit us in the chat. Um, and in the meantime, let's hear from Big Mike. You hear me? We can. Lute was having trouble with my T-Mobile service Android phone. Couldn't seem to connect with the part I was trying to reach. Kept getting a dialing icon on the screen. And finally, the recorded robotic message, all circuits are busy at the moment. Please try again later. Figured it was a matter of an overdue monthly bill. Technically, my service ended at midnight. So decided to head across 14th Street from Union Square Park to make a payment. Hey, how you doing, Big Mike? The sales representative knows me by name. I guess I better pay my bill before you cut off my service. I haven't been able to make a call all day. That's because it looks like there's some sort of nationwide network outage. Facebook and Twitter are out too. They say it might be some sort of cyber attack by a hostile foreign power. So did you guys get hit that last Monday night during all the looting? No, nah, nothing got taken. We got that metal shutter. It completely covers the front area of the storefront. They couldn't get in. I was still living in the Bronx during the Great Blackout in July of 78. The next day, the sidewalks of the Grand Concourse and Broadway in Manhattan were littered with those metal shutters where the looters had ripped them down from the storefronts. They didn't stop nobody from looting. Now, our gate lines up flush with the sidewalk outside so they couldn't get their hands underneath it. They didn't have a crowbar or anything to pry it up with. Goes to show you, there was obviously no planning or coordination by those looters. If Antifa or criminal gangs were really orchestrating all the looting, they would have brought along some proper burglary tools despite what the mayor and the police commissioner claim. They were just random brands of marauders participating in crimes of opportunity. They were even using those city bank uh, rental bikes to smash windows with. Would an organized anarchist act like that? I see they got the Foot Locker next door and the Reeboks across the street. Yeah, but they didn't take anything. They just smashed the front window and left it empty-handed. But the GameStop, they got hit three separate times on three separate days. There's absolutely nothing left to steal now. You see how they looted the Strand bookstore on Broadway and 12th? Supposedly, that's where Kiara, the mayor's daughter, got arrested. I mean, what were they going to do? Run off with an unabridged set of complete works of Shakespeare? And how were they going to haul it away? 
you know, there's some really valuable merchandise in stock there. Yeah, first editions worth uh, hundreds, even thousands. I can just imagine the conversations the next day. What did you get? Got me a fresh set of New Air Jordans, some Chanel Number no. 5 perfume, and a brand new Gucci handbag. What did you get? Well, I got me a 1926 first edition hardcover Charles Scribner's and Sons copy of The Sun Also Rises with original dust jacket, illustrated art deco style, signed with a dedication from the author, Papa Ernest Hemingway himself. Going to put it up for auction at Sotheby's next fall. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Big Mike. Well, it seems like uh, our, our dear friend Larissa has, has disappeared off the Wi-Fi. Um, so Jonathan and I will terminate this wonderful evening. Thanks so much, everybody. Once again, it was fantastic. Um, Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. And thanks for tuning in from all sorts of places, from Australia to Mexico. Um, thank you so much. Um, lots of love. Hang in there. It's going to be an even longer hole than we ever thought it's going to be. Um, but with poetry, we shall survive. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you.